Good evening, and welcome to uh, this evening's uh, Toledo National Association uh, program. Uh, my name is Jim Witter, and I am the Toledo National Association Vice President and Program Chair. And uh, before we get started with uh, our presentation, uh, the unwanted and invasive uh, species update, I uh, wanted to let you know uh, a couple things uh, on uh, TNA's uh, website. I uh, wanted to mention uh, that we are uh, looking for donations to the Waterbury uh, Fund, and I will uh, drop that link uh, in a minute uh, into the chat. Um, and uh, Toledo Natural Association is uh, collecting donations for the Waterbury Fund that will go towards the Sandhill Cranes, uh, sorry, the Sandhill Cranes uh, wetland. Uh, and so uh, we're excited about that uh, project uh, over on uh, the Western side of uh, the county. And we'd also uh, like to uh, highlight, uh, if you know any students uh, coming up on the deadline, April 15th uh, for the Mallory Scholarship Fund. Uh, it's something I think that we don't always get a whole lot of uh, folks that are aware of it, but uh, for students uh, who have an interest in natural history, uh, we have a scholarship fund uh, for folks that are uh, pursuing uh, interests in education in uh, natural sciences and natural history. And um, you can find that uh, around the same link uh, there. Uh, and I will uh, put that into uh, the chat uh, here uh, soon, as well as you mentioned in the chat, we have you all on uh, with the microphones uh, muted. Um, and if you have questions throughout the presentation, uh, I'll be acting as the uh, MC uh, and uh, kind of following uh, the questions. And uh, we'll get uh, to those questions uh, toward uh, at the end of the presentation, if you'd like to stick around uh, for those, probably uh, wrapping up around eight, and then with uh, subsequent questions. And uh, there it is. Thanks so much to, uh, to John. Dwyer, who's already into the chat here, uh, chat there. And so, yeah, if you have uh, questions, you can uh, put them uh, in there. And uh, so uh, without uh, any uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our uh, program uh, guest uh, speaker uh, tonight, uh, Amy Stone, who again will be presenting on the Unwanted Invasive Species Update. And um, Amy, is the Extension ed Educator with uh, Ohio State University uh, in Lucas County. Uh, began working with the Extension Office in 1992, and she's been in uh, Lucas County uh, here since 2000. Uh, Amy's earned degrees from Owens Community College and the University of Toledo, uh, including a master's degree in uh, vocational education. And she specializes in horticulture um, and has uh, evolved to include invasive species uh, began with a local infestation, ready, of the formerly named gypsy, gypsy moth, now the spongy moth. You may have, <laughs> may have heard that uh, name change, um, and uh, which began uh, around the mid-90s. Um, 2003, Amy collected, uh, submitted the first known infestation of the emerald ash borer, so she is well qualified to speak on invasive species for uh, someone who, yeah, is on top of it. Um, and worked on uh, the Emerald Ash Borer for uh, 10 years with the USDA uh, project dollars. Um, and uh, as Ohio faces uh, numerous invasive species threats, uh, Amy is a part of the extension team that uh, addresses uh, the invasive threats through education and outreach, like tonight, like we're, like we're doing uh, right now. And uh, Amy and her husband uh, live uh, on her husband's grandparents' farm in Southeast Michigan, uh, where they have a 40-acre truck farm and sell produce at uh, Detroit's Eastern Market. Um, and while the stone garden is uh, a bit smaller than the previous generation, uh, they enjoy growing produce uh, from the garden and chickens as well. Uh, and Amy and her husband have two grown children and two grandchildren, and not uh, last but not least, uh, three papillons. Uh, so <laughs> I guess work them in. So we're very glad to have Amy uh, here tonight. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Amy, and, and sharing uh, your knowledge with us. Absolutely. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Are you seeing that, Jim? All right, perfect. 
we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so yes, we have three Papillons, um, but we are dog sitting uh, for my daughter. And so we have a, a little crew downstairs and I told them they better behave and not interrupt tonight's meeting. So hopefully they'll be quiet. Um, we're gonna go ahead and talk about uh, the unwanted and invasive species update. I'd like to start with just a little bit, um, kind of about my extension involvement. And in addition to invasive species, I'm also um, a co-team coordinator for our Buckeye Environmental Horticulture Team, which is a statewide team with individuals like myself, state specialists, regional specialists. Um, and one of the things that we do is we write a, um, a blog now called the Buckeye or the Beagle. And so I'll, I have that slide in just a second. Um, so just kind of giving you a few extension commercials here. If tonight's program, you know, interests you and you want to dig a little bit deeper, we have an Ohio Woodland Stewards program. Um, and I see that Stan Garrett is going to be one of your speakers next month. And so Stan is also in the School of Environment and Natural Resources. So lots of good resources, um, some um, videos that are on their YouTube channel, um, great fact sheets. So if you just want to keep digging deeper. And then, of course, our Buckeye Yard and Garden line that you can sign up um, in this little where it says alerts um, and you can get email alerts when new articles are posted. And so that'll take you then to the link where you've got great photos and information. And I find in Northwest Ohio, it's a bit of a prediction um, ball that you can or that crystal ball, because when Joe Boggs in Cincinnati uh, reports that he's seen something, we've got about 10 days to 14 days before it shows up here in the Toledo area. And so you can impress all your friends and family by making some predictions about plants that are in bloom or insect activity. But back to the, the title of the talk tonight, um, I really hope that I continue to raise awareness. I mean, obviously you're interested, you're here tuning in. Um, increase your knowledge along the way, and maybe some understanding of some different invasive species. I hope to empower you to share and spread the word. So I often give homework in my presentations, and that homework is to at least share one maybe new fact that you learned or that was, you know, repeated. Maybe you knew it before, but it was, it's a good message. And so to share that with somebody else in the upcoming um, end of the week weekend. Do that by engaging others, friends, families, neighbors, because the more people we can have talking about invasive species, I think the better the dialogue and things can happen as far as early detection and early reporting. And then of course, of course continue um, learning. And so I always start out with a little bit of a pest clause in the beginning of my programs because the facts that I'm presenting tonight are as of tonight. And so who knows what tomorrow may bring. And so, you know, I hope it's not more invasive species or new locations, but that sometimes happens. And so um, don't take what I say tonight as the absolute, the end of the information because that continues to evolve. I wanna encourage you to become a member of the Invasive Species Army. And what that means is that you're willing to, when you're out, gardening and enjoying nature, if you see something that's strange or unusual that you haven't seen before, um, don't hesitate to take a photo, um, send it to me um, to take a look at because who knows what the next invasive species may be. And I know Jim mentioned that I was the first one to find emerald ash borer here in the state of Ohio, but it really wasn't me. It was a homeowner who was noticing this strange thing happening on his ash tree where the bark was falling off. And so, yes, he contacted me through the extension channels and I was able to go out um, and then confirm uh, what we suspected, uh, but it was, it was him. And so if he didn't make that phone call, potentially emerald ash borer would have, you know, the populations would have built even greater than what they were. And so really encouraging people to know what's happening around and then, you know, make those calls if you see something that you haven't noticed before. 
I always start my presentations, um, and it's a little bit more difficult um, using Zoom, but think of the, the term native and what that means to you. What are some adjectives? What words resonate when somebody says native? And often people shout out, you know, their answers, but, you know, something that has evolved over time in a location, something that's been there for a while. And then oppositely, you know, if somebody says non-native, what does that mean? And of course, you know, being introduced, brought into a, a situation where it wasn't originally. And then the third term that I love to kind of identify is invasive. And for something to be invasive, it causes some harm. And that harm could be um, to human health, it could be to the economy, it could be to other, uh, other species. But for something to be invasive, it has to be non-native. And the other point of clarification I often like to make is if something is non-native, it doesn't necessarily mean that in, it's invasive also. And so there are some things that are non-native um, that aren't invasive. And so this is a really good example. So our European honeybee, not native, but surely not invasive, right? Um, in fact, it's it's um, has problems of its own um, that we're concerned with. And then this, if I don't know if anybody's ever had this reaction on their skin, um, it's a result of poison ivy. And I've heard so many people call poison ivy invasive. Um, and it can be problematic. It's definitely aggressive. And it's, it's, it's an issue, especially if you react to that. But poison ivy is a native plant. So it really can't be termed invasive. So I'm really getting you thinking, OK? Um, hopefully, we're, in, we're, we're engaging even though we're, we're on the screen. What do you think? Do invasive species increase or decrease biodiversity? And so just think, you know, in your mind, maybe yell it out if you're home alone. What do you think? Do they increase or decrease biodiversity? I will say if anybody yelled either one of those out, they were right. So think about it. When a new species is introduced, it actually increases biodiversity because we have a new species. But ultimately, because it's invasive, usually at the detriment of other species, it decreases biodiversity. And so as long as you said something, you were right. And then let's just talk just kind of a couple definitions or um, important things before we get started and kind of doing some case studies is an invasive species is an organism that's growing or living outside its native or natural range, often human introduced, sometimes for the best of intentions, um, and sometimes it's accidental, but it's through what we need that it gets here to the United States. Uh, it's also, and I mentioned this earlier, it's a species that um, can spread rapidly into unwanted areas, right? And so often to the detriment of native plant systems and other native species. So the impact that emerald ash borer not only had on ash trees, but it also had an impact on insects that also fed upon ash trees. And so when I see say fed upon, it doesn't kill the ash trees are these native species, right? They evolve over time and get along with the plants. Uh, but emerald ash borer has definitely impacted their numbers, unless, of course, they were generalist and found another food source. I know this topic can be depressing, um, and this is not supposed to be uplifting at all. But know that when we talk about invasive species, it's a two-way street. And so our native fall webworm that we often see in the fall creating these webs and nests, um, often on fruit trees and ornamental um, trees, it's native, right? It's not a big deal. Aesthetically, we might not like it, uh, but it never you know, kills its host plant here in the United States. Unfortunately, it's made its way to China, where they have named that insect the American white moth as its common name. It's non-native there. And in fact, um, 
causing serious threats to their fruit industry, including apples. And so, they, you know, it's a two-way street. And as long as we're a global society, there is the potential of these non-native species um, becoming problematic. And so why, why are they a big deal, right? And so um, obviously as naturalists, um, loving nature, there's the impact that it potentially could have on, on butterflies and birds. Our native pollinators include um, our native bees. And so everything in the environment um, can be off kilter, right? Because of these invasive species. And that could be an insect, it could be a plant, it could be a disease. And so what we're gonna do for the next, oh, 45 minutes or so, uh, we are gonna talk about what I have randomly chosen as my top 10. So our first one um, is an invasive plant called calorie pear. Um, I'm sure that everybody is aware of this uh, plant. So it is actually imported um, because it had some resistance to fire blight. And so the eating pear, the orchardists were very interested in looking at its genetics to hopefully breed that into the eating eating pears um, so they were more resistant to fire blight. And as they were doing this research a long time ago, people liked the characteristics of this tree. You know, it had pretty flowers, it had nice glossy leaves, good fall color, um, it didn't get too huge. And so it really became a popular tree for landscapes and communities. It was over planted, uh, which always is problematic, right? So we don't, we want to avoid monocultures. But what happened is that particular plant was sterile. And so it really didn't produce a lot of fruit um, and was not problematic. And so that's the straight species, the, the calorie pear. But what happened with calorie pear is they have weak crotch attachments. And so just as that tree was getting a nice size, uh, we'd have a windstorm, a snowstorm, and a third of the plant would break off. And so obviously that was not a good thing. And so nursery growers were like, you know, this plant still has some good characteristics, some good things about it. Let's work on the branch structure of this plant and bring those to market. And they did. And in fact, a lot of that happened in Ohio. Um, Cleveland Select, Aristocrat, uh, were all from Ohio nurseries. But that's when the problem started. And so they didn't realize that when those plants were put into the landscape, they began crossing. And the fruit that was produced was very viable. And so when the birds would come in in the fall and eat the, the fruit, you know, they would fly off, deposit the seeds along the way, and the picture um, that you see on the right-hand side, I mean, we see this throughout the state and it's really unfortunate. You know, we, we learned our lesson, but it was way too late. Um, you know, I, I talked about how, you know, this plant was kind of a, a perfect plant for some situations. In fact, Michael Durr, um, who is kind of a, the, the plantsman uh, of woody plants um, here in the United States, um, had some schooling at Ohio State and then also was down at the University of Georgia before retiring. He said, oh my gosh, this is almost like the perfect tree. You can plant it anywhere, um, you know, sandy soils, concrete type soils, and it's going to grow. And so that's where it became overplanted. And then this is what we're seeing as a result. And so it won't be long with the temperatures that we are seeing today and this week that we are gonna start to see a sea of white, especially in these natural areas, disturbed areas where the plants really take off, um, especially underneath power lines. And the one that I wanted to mention is when that original plant was brought over from Asia, it had thorns. And wouldn't you know, some of these wild calorie pears that are popping up have reverted and we're seeing thorns, which can be dangerous when we talk about removals. 
in Ohio, the Ohio Department of Agriculture is kind of the regulatory authority on a lot of different things, um, and most recently um, on invasive plants. And so they have a list of invasive plants that cannot be sold, purchased, or planted here in the state of Ohio. And as part of this list, um, calorie pear will, it'll be illegal to sell, plant, and um, purchase next January. So the countdown has begun. It's less than 12 months away. And what is really important, a lot of people say, well, why did they give them five years to implement this? We know how bad calorie pear is. Um, and so you have to think from the nursery side, because when the nursery growers grow plants, I mean, it's a five, seven, 10 year investment. And so they wanted um, to give them the opportunity to be able to shift and start growing other plants, especially those that, you know, had really had an investment in the ornamental pears. So with that said, a lot of nursery growers after this was, you know, five years ago or well, four and a half years ago, they said, okay, we're done. And they cut down the pears and they've started new. There are some that still have pears. And so I assume that this summer they'll be put on sale because they're going to want to get rid of them before they can't sell them. And so our job is to encourage people to really make the investment in a better tree that won't cause problems. And so that's kind of the story and where we are with um, the ornamental pears. My next insect, so number nine, we'll do the countdown, is um, the spongy moth, formerly known as the gypsy moth. I also have referred to it as the very hungry caterpillar. Um, not to make light of the new name change, but um, somebody that I work with came up with this. Um, and so when somebody thinks of spongy moth, they may be thinking of SpongeBob. But it's the same insect that oaks are a favorite, but they'll feed on over 500 different plants. And gypsy moth has been in our area for a very long time. Um, I first was exposed to to the spongy moth, sorry, I sometimes still slip and call it gypsy moth. The spongy moth in the mid 90s when there was an outbreak in um, the Sylvania area, West Toledo area. And what's happening right now is if gypsy moth or if spongy moth is present, um, they are gonna start to hatch when red bud is in bloom. So they are, um, they coincide those two events. So they don't have really anything, a relationship but gypsy, but spongy moth caterpillars hatch when red bud is blooming. And so when they hatch, they're very small, they're very tiny, really kind of unnoticeable. And most people just don't pay any attention to that or don't see them. It's not until the caterpillar gets to this size that, um, and they are feeding machines that it becomes problematic. And so this could be an oak tree on your property, in your neighbor's property, in our park system uh, that's been defoliated by the gypsy moth caterpillars or spongy moth caterpillars. I think I need to put that title on all my slides just to make sure that I remember and don't go back into history. Some good news on the spongy moth front is there are some viruses, there's um, a fungus, and there's also some other um, predators and parasitoids that help try to manage those numbers. Now, they do a really good job, but often we still have some outbreaks that we manage in other ways. And so if you look at uh, the caterpillar on the left-hand side, um, that is, uh, probably about a fifth or sixth instar caterpillar. So still kind of working in that development stage. Um, kind of pupation is right around the corner. The one in the center, if you notice, the body has shrunk up. If you pull that off the tree, it actually stands out like a, or stands up like a toothpick. Now you only want to do this once that body um, kind of shrinks in. And so this particular caterpillar was killed by a fungus called Entomophaga myamiga. And so I just, you know that when the caterpillars die hanging head down, um, that's killed by the fungus. And there's often just full of spores. And so early on in the infestation, 
we would actually go out and collect these dead cadavers and we put them in some soil and then we would spread those around um, hoping to spread the spores that was specific to um, the caterpillar. And so we do have entomophaga throughout the county. The other caterpillar you'll notice on the far right actually is um, kind of hanging down in an upside down V pattern. And this one was killed by a virus and it's called MPV. And so we see the virus happen or occur when populations are really high. And so entomophaga can happen in low populations, mid populations and high, but the virus typically only occurs when populations are really high and defoliation is occurring. So once those caterpillars are done feeding um, and maybe have missed the virus or the fungus, they will then pupate and become adults later in that season. There's one generation per year. You'll see here the moths, the dark one in the forefront is the male. And if you look at his antenna really closely, they almost look like feathers. So they're receptors of the pheromone that the female or the, the larger white moth gives off. She is usually so heavy and loaded with eggs um, when she emerges from that pupil casing that she can't fly. So she gives off the pheromone and the male comes to her to mate. And what happens is then she lays an egg mass that can be 50 to sometimes up to 500 eggs. She covers them up with the hairs from her abdomen and it almost kind of looks like felt. And she does this to protect the eggs from winter temperatures and also some parasitoids and predators. And so right now, if you went out to look for gypsy moth egg masses, you'd see that they're just a little bit more bleached in color or lighter in color. You can see often there's pupil casings near the egg masses because that's where the female emerged from the pupil casing and then gave off the pheromone. The male came to her and then she laid egg masses in that same area. So right now we're kind of at a good stage for gypsy moth although or spongy moth, although populations likely will start to increase. Um, the Ohio Department of Agriculture does have a program that people can um, apply to them to do large scale treatments with organic insecticides. Additionally, they have efforts across the state uh, with some pheromone flakes. And so, you know, that the female gives off a pheromone in nature, but what scientists have discovered is they have created a pheromone uh, that mimics the spongy moth and they adhere that to these small little flakes um, that have a sticky substance, so they're applying them through aerial application. They get caught up in the canopy and they do this just prior to the adult emergence. And so as that adult male emerges, the whole world, his whole world smells like a female. And so he like flies around trying to find her. Uh, unfortunately, I would assume he dies very frustrated uh, because he can never mate. Um, and that's usually done on when populations are relatively low. And so if there are so many females, um, it's not as effective, but it has been a really good tool for ODA and the US, um, USDA Forest Service to help manage populations. All right, so enough on the spongy moth. We're gonna go to number eight, and this one's gonna be a quick one. Um, I just have to include it because I spent so much time um, doing outreach on this insect and it kind of is old news here in Ohio. Uh, this just gives you an idea of unfortunately where the insect is known to be. And so as far out as Colorado now, um, down into Georgia, Texas, you can see the bulk of the population is you know, somewhat the natural spread, um, especially in kind of that tri-state area of Michigan, Indiana, and um, Ohio, um, and then some artificial movement, unfortunately, through firewood and nursery stock. Um, again, humans um, moving things, you know, faster and further than the natural spread of the actual insect. Um, so we do have populations still around. Um, so there have been individuals who've treated and protected trees for a long time. 
we're starting to see numbers just kind of climb back up slowly. And so there have been some um, local residents that actually have initiated treatments again to protect those ash trees. And so um, it's not necessary to make yearly treatments, especially if you're watching your tree, uh, but you do want to pay attention. And one of the things that you're going to really probably pay attention the most would be woodpeckers coming back in um, and finding the larvae in the tree. They have a keen sense of where emerald ash borer is. And so they can be kind of our guidance, our hints of when we need to start treatment again to protect those trees. Number seven, the viburnum leaf beetle. And so this unfortunately is rearing its head here in uh, the greater Toledo area and we are seeing more of it. It was first found in New York in 1996. So it's been around for a while. It finally made it to the state of Ohio in 2002. It's a slow mover, um, especially if we don't move it qu more quickly. But in 2013, it was kind of found in north central Ohio, the Mansfield area, Worcester. Um, the beetle overwinters in the egg stage. And so right now, if you have viburnums, um, it's a great opportunity to go out and look for those egg laying sites. Do some pruning, do some removing, because you can really impact the population by doing that. Now, not everybody does it, and so, you know, numbers will continue to build, um, but if you have it and you've done pruning and, you know, share that information with the, the neighbors around you, you really can impact um, the numbers and the pressure that you'll see in the upcoming season. Defoliation usually occurs um, in late June all the way through October, so both the larvae and the adults will feed. Um, on the viburnum leaves. All right, so this is what you're actually going to be looking for. So the photo on the left, what happens is the adult beetle will chew these little pits or divots and then she turns around, lays individual eggs. So there are, let me look here, hopefully you can see my pointer. So one, two, maybe three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And so those are all individual eggs that are laid. Um, she actually covers them up with kind of a, uh, a frassy type sawdust um, blanket that again protects them through the winter and other parasitoids and predators coming in to get them. But simply by cutting this branch off, pruning this tip of the branch off, you've reduced the population. If you do not, what's gonna happen in the spring is the larvae that is on the top photo will hatch and they'll begin feeding. I think for the, my, through just my personal observation is a lot of times they feed on the undersides of the leaves. And so you notice the holes, but you don't actually see the critter. And so, you know, lift them up, look underneath to see if you see that feeding damage, that injury or them. They are going to fall into the soil where they pupate and then they'll come out of the soil as adult beetles they will feed some more, they'll mate, and then the female will lay eggs. And to give you kind of just a perspective on size, there's my hand with one of the larvae. So um, they're not a, a large insect, and especially if we can compare it to the spongy moth, uh, but they have a, a good appetite. And then here's the adult on some fruit of the viburnum. Curtis Young is one of our entomologists with Ohio State. He has written or authored a fact sheet on the viburnum leaf beetle, has a lot of good information. Um, the one thing that I really like is towards the back of the fact sheet, but it lists the most susceptible viburnums, the moderately susceptible, and the least susceptible. Um, not to say that they won't have any feeding injury or damage, um, but often, you know, they do fine. Number one in my book is arrowwood. And so if you have a variety of viburnums in your landscape, um, I would just watch the arrowwood because that's probably going to be the first plant that they attack. Okay, so this one may be new, um, maybe not, uh, but it's called the box tree moth. Um, and it's interesting. So it's box tree moth, but it actually goes after box woods which aren't trees at all. 
Um, I did a presentation a couple of weeks ago in Michigan, and so I pulled this um, post from Michigan State University that was done last summer when these plants were shipped in from Canada to multiple states, including Ohio and Michigan. And so what we're looking for is, and I'll show you some photos of what the feeding damage looks like on boxwood. If you have boxwood uh, that are older established, um, you likely won't have this unless you've planted new boxwoods that were infested at the time um, or a neighbor has purchased infested boxwoods. They've done a lot of stop sales last summer, and so they confiscated the material and destroyed it before it got out into the landscape. But we do know that some of those plants were sold, and so they're trying to, to determine where they went and um, how widespread that is. And so this is the caterpillar um, that will feed on the boxwoods, and this is the damage. And so, you know, it doesn't look like typical insect damage that we see on boxwoods. Um, but if you see, they leave the veins, uh, which is that white kind of stringy thing that you see on the photo. And so other than that, they're eating entire leaves. Um, so this is likely what you would notice in your landscape. Um, you may or may not notice the adult activity. Uh, this is the same insect it just has different color types and so um, again you likely probably see the larvae or the damage uh, but you may see some of those flying around so if you see a moth and have boxwood so it would be really active in the boxwood area um, please let us know so we can do some follow-up and let ODA come out and and scout that area all right halfway there and we're doing pretty good on time. I may have to speed up just a little bit. So number five is the spotted lantern fly. Um, this one has kind of been on the radar. We've watched it as it moved from Pennsylvania to other multiple states um, since its first discovery in 2014. Um, it has a pretty wide native host range or native uh, range. In 2006, it was actually discovered as an invasive in Korea and really was impacting their vineyards. Um, and then you can see in 2014, it was discovered in Pennsylvania, not too far from Philadelphia. It unfortunately is spreading on its own. And then again, us humans, um, this one is a hitchhiker. And so um, it is actually caught um, the trains. And so either egg masses were on trains or even nymphs or adults have grabbed on. And then wherever those trains go, they fall off, they jump off, they fly off, and then you can get a new established population. In 2020, we had our first discovery in Ohio of a reproducing population, and I'll let you know kind of where we're at. Um, nothing in Northwest Ohio yet, um, but really want to encourage people to look for this, especially over the summer. So we've got one generation per year. Um, currently, it's in the egg mass stage. We'll see some actual photos of what that egg mass looks like. They have an incomplete life cycle, so they go through four instars as nymphs, and then that fourth instar, which has kind of a splash of red to it, will molt into the adults. Um, they lay eggs. They cannot winter over, so once we have a good freeze or um, hard freeze, all the adults will be killed, but the egg masses can winter over. This insect is a plant hopper. It's kind of confusing. It has fly in its name. And if you look at the picture on the left, some people would say, gosh, that almost looks moth-like. Uh, but if you look at the picture in the center, um, right here, this is their mouth part. And so they are phloem feeders. You're going to see them on stems, trunks, and branches. You're not going to see them feeding on fruit or leaves. Uh, they need that sugary substance that's in the phloem. The adults, which is likely is what stage of the insect that you're going to find if it's here, they're about one inch long, half inch wide, and uh, they're very bright and beautiful, um, unfortunately. Uh, this was one that was captured in Jefferson County. Um, it's a female, and she was full of eggs, so they were pretty excited to capture her before she actually laid um, eggs for the next season. The adults are going to appear August through, again, 
could be up to November, maybe even December, um, depending on what our weather conditions are. I said they're big and they're beautiful and they really stand out. But in this photo, and I realize it's kind of small, uh, there are 13 adults, so they can camouflage in. Those adults um, will feed, they'll uh, mate, and then they're going to lay eggs. The females can lay one to two egg masses in her lifetime and usually between 30 to 50 eggs in each of those masses. And so she lays the eggs kind of in rows or columns, and then she covers this them up with a secretion. And when it happens, it's kind of a, a light gray color. It's kind of waxy. Um, and as the season progresses, it almost looks more like mud and begins to crack. You can see here on this egg mass, she's covered it a lot with that, that waxy secretion, but you can see some exposed eggs here. It's not to say that those exposed eggs won't survive. Um, they will. But there has been research to say that those that are covered up tend to have a higher rate um, of hatching the following season. And so here's just an example of kind of what I describe as that, that mud kind of appearance and the egg mass on the bottom. And then you'll see the eggs laid individually that something happened to her that she wasn't able to cover them up. So that's you know just the eggs exposed. Egg masses can be laid on any flat surface and depending on the color of the tree can blend in pretty easily. Any surface, um, they have found that they are, they kind of have an affinity. They are drawn to rusty metal surfaces. So like the burning barrel there, um, trains, unfortunately, and that's how it's kind of hopping around and moving across the area. Here's the same egg mass taken earlier in the season on the left and later in the season on the right. And so right now, this is probably what the egg masses look like um, if they were present in the area. So from that egg mass, the nymphs are going to hatch. Um, again, first, second, and third instar are black with white. Fourth instar has that splash of red. They will also feed um, just like the adults with those piercing, sucking mouth parts um, and again, getting into that phloem tissue. So when they pull out that mouth part, sometimes we'll see a little sap run. Um, and then also because they're, they're sap feeders, they are prolific honeydew producers. And so often you'll see a collection of honeydew, kind of a sticky, um, sweet substance, their excrement. And then you'll see black sooty mold kind of attach itself to that um, honeydew. And then in the fall, we'll see an increase of kind of our stinging wasps that are attracted to that sweetness. So wasps and hornets. And so if you see a lot of wasp and hornet activity, um, really kind of focus in to see what they're after and potentially there could be spotted lanternfly. I love this from uh, Penn State. So it kind of gives us a, on a calendar approach what to look for when. And so we'll be looking for eggs up through May. Although the nymphs will start to hatch uh, the end of April going into May. And in fact, I was on a science call today. Um, they've done some growing degree day um, work. And if spotted lanternfly were in Virginia Beach, where one of the scientists was at today, um, they would like the first percent of nymphs would be hatching. So they've reached that um, growing degree day accumulation. So you can see that the band of when the nymphs are active and then of course when the adults are active. We're really concerned about the eggs because they could be moved great distances. Uh, we do know that the adults are weak flyers. So often they climb up as high as they can and they kind of catapult and glide off. So telephone poles, utility poles, cell phone towers, um, anything that's upright, they're going to climb to the top and jump off to go find their, um, their host plant that they want to feed on. Whenever we encourage people to look, they're going to find a lot of other insects, right, in the, in, along the way. And so Virginia has done a nice job with some lookalikes. And so I have these in the office that I've actually laminated and take out to presentations. Uh, but these are some ones that um, commonly get confused with spotted lanternfly. And when you look at them side by side, there's a there's a difference, right? You can tell that this one's spotted lanternfly and this is not. 
but imagine yourself out in nature and coming across one of these other insects and you know it may take your breath away and think oh is it spotted lanternfly or not same thing with their asses and you can see um this is an old copy so i'm sure that they've updated the um, spongy moth egg masses there kind of in the center. And then finally, the nymphs. So they sometimes are confused with the wheel bugs, the assassin bugs, and the oak tree hopper nymphs as well. They have a huge host range. Um, their favorite is tree of heaven um, and our grapes. But you can see they'll feed on roses um, as nymphs early on. Silver maples, red maples, they only feed as adults. And so if you're scouting, this is kind of important to know what they're eating when and what you're gonna be looking for. So there are quarantines in place to hopefully spread or to slow the spread of this insect. Uh, but we do know that nursery stock, Christmas tree um, growers, firewood, campers, um, semis, any kind of traffic, can be responsible for the movement. And I also mentioned trains. And unfortunately, the infestations here in Ohio have been located near main railways um, and Alanthus. And so we'll talk about that in just a second. Updated map of kind of where populations are. And so you can see the bulk of the population here in Pennsylvania. And in fact, Berks County was the first find of um, spotted lanternfly just outside of Philadelphia. We've got Jefferson County, Cuyahoga County. We have a new find in Lorraine that was just confirmed through DNA analysis this week. Um, so that likely will become another blue county. And then you can see this blue county down here in Switzerland, Indiana, or Switzerland County, Indiana. And so that, uh, my understanding was there were homeowners that lived out east where spotted lanternfly was known to exist. They moved to Indiana and unfortunately, some spotted lantern flies moved with them. So I encourage you to um, look, 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 and report, report, report. So if you see anything that you sus suspect might be spotted lantern fly, please let us know. I had to squeeze another one in here, so I put this as number five and a half. Um, it's a lanthus, so a non-native tree. And the reason I put it in here is because Tree of Heaven is the spotted lanternfly's number one host. And in fact, I can't lie, when I heard this, I kind of cheered because I thought, oh good, maybe it's a biological control for a lanthus. Unfortunately, it doesn't outright kill the host. Um, but if you see a lanthus, um, obviously we'd hope that you would manage that. Um, but if you see it on, you know, public property or, or private property that has public access um, and they're not getting rid of it, um, take a look at it and see if you um, see any spotted lanternfly feeding. And the reason it's problematic is it's a prolific seeder. And so um, the female trees, so there's male and females, can produce up to 300,000 seeds in a year. And so lots of babies. Um, and in addition to them seeding, if you cut down an Alanthus, uh, one of our forestry faculty who's now retired said hundreds of its relatives are going to come to the funeral because through those sucker sprouts. And so this is one that often um, you're going to cut down and do a uh, herbis in combination, or you can just have additional problems. Number four is the jumping worms. And I really um, hope that you can kind of help us out, be on the lookout for this. We're actually going to do um, a, a project, um, hopefully that I'm gonna be writing about in one of my upcoming blade articles where we take mustard powder, dried mustard powder, you mix it in a gallon of water and you pour it in an area where potentially these jumping worms could be. The mustard um, is an irritant and so the jumping worms and other insects are gonna come up to the soil surface. A lot of people say, well, how do you know if it's the Asian jumping worm? Um, they are like snakes. So they literally don't jump, but they flail and move really, really quickly. 
And you can see this is a distinguishing characteristic of the Asian jumping worm. So there's more information on our beagle about that. And stay tuned if you would like. Uh, we're going to have packets of the dried mustard that people can pick up at the office and then report their findings just to do some monitoring, hopefully ahead. Uh, we do know that they are here in Ohio. And unfortunately, as gardeners, um, if you're sharing plants, um, you potentially could be sharing the insects and make sure that we find it as soon as possible and continue to educate individuals so we're not moving it around. Number three, oriental bittersweet. Um, so this is the kudzu of the north, people have said. Prefers sun to part shade, but I've seen it in dense shade doing remarkably. And so, you know, it was brought into the country for its ornamental value. Um, unfortunately, um, so we have native bittersweet, but um, native bittersweet and oriental bittersweet will hybridize. And so we're seeing some hybrids too. And often those hybrids have the aggressiveness, um, the invasiveness. Um, of just the straight species of oriental bittersweet. And so vines can climb, you know, 70 or 60 feet up in the air. Um, but what is really problematic about bittersweet is they, the vines twist and they can girdle plants that they're using for their support and actually kill them. If you're interested in kind of, oh gosh, do I have American bittersweet or is it oriental bittersweet? Take a look at this, um, USGS, um, it walks you through um, the two and what to look for and what those or what those um, characteristics would be. With that said, remember though, they're hybridizing and so you may have a plant that has characteristics of both. Okay, we're getting close, two more to go. Uh, number two is kudzu. And so I kind of mentioned it, you know, oriental bittersweet was the kudzu of the north. Um, early in my career, we thought, gosh, Kudzu is not going to be up here. It can't stand our winters. Unfortunately, it can. And so these two photos were taken in Sinclairsville, uh, which is kind of on the eastern side of the state, a little bit obviously south. Um, but it's here. Um, it's in Cincinnati, and it has been for a while. It's in Cleveland, unfortunately. And so this is... Oh, it's so sad to see this because it's so aggressive. Um, this one, again, human introduced. It was introduced in the 1800s as a forage plant. Um, it was used for erosion control, um, also planted by the CCC. But then in the 1950s, USDA removed it from the, the permissible cover crop list. And so, but at that point, you know, the, the horse was out of the barn. It has a compound leaf. I say it, I mean, think of, you know, when we say compound leaf, we often think of poison ivy. So this is like poison ivy leaves on steroids. Um, you know, they could be as big as a dinner plate. These are some photos that I took in the um, Cleveland um, area that has the population. And you can see growing up the utility poles along the lines. Um, there was a garage with an old kind of abandoned car that my thought was the following year, you wouldn't even be able to see that car. It'll just be covered up. And so interesting enough, um, there was a somebody from um, NPR was doing a story about kudzu in Ohio and um, and nobody else was able to do the interview. So I ran over to meet with them and I wasn't even out of my car and like she had the mic up. What do you think? And it was the first time that I had been to the site. And so I got out and we started chatting and I said, you know, in Ohio, obviously it's adapted to our cold conditions, but we're, we remain hopeful that our window, um, our growing season was, would be too short that it, you know, it may or may not flower. Um, and certainly if it flowers, we wouldn't have enough time uh, for it to produce viable seeds. And so as we walked through this area, she was like, like those flowers over there? I'm like, yep, those are the flowers. So we remain hopeful that they're still not going to be able to produce the seed. And she's like, you mean those fuzzy things over there? And I'm like, uh, yeah, so they have 
adapted and are reproducing and, and setting seeds. And so I said, okay, I think we need to start this interview over um, because we have, you know, the reprodu reproduction, unfortunately. Um, so again, this one, we haven't found it in Northwest Ohio. Um, it's not to say that it's not here, uh, but if you see anything that you suspect, please let us know because it's so much easier to manage uh, when populations are low and there aren't as many plants. They um, are vines, right? And so it's almost like a strawberry with stolons in that wherever that vine touches soil, and I use the term soil pretty loosely because we were in a parking lot that was pretty much all gravel, and wherever that vine touched the, the um, gravel, there was a new plant that started. So there were adventitious roots that came out. And so now there's, instead of one long vine, you know, there may be 20 plants off of that vine that were created. Okay, I've got one more to cover. Uh, the last one, I shouldn't say save the best for last, uh, but I, I often will talk about Asian longhorn beetle last because of the success story that's tied to this insect. And so you can see here how it got its name, Asian longhorn beetle. So it's long antenna. They're banded black and white. And sometimes it's hard to see, uh, but you can see kind of a, a light blue cast on its legs. And sometimes it, we even see it at the base of the antenna. Um, it's not overly obvious. Um, the other name for this insect is the starry night beetle, so black with white spots. And I like to describe those white spots as, think of somebody who took a children's paintbrush. They dipped it in white paint once, and they started making those dots, those spots. And so the first ones were, you know, the first spots that they created, they're a little bit larger. But you can see there's some that are very small as the paint disappeared from that brush. And I don't know, it just is kind of a good analogy um, or a good description. This insect also has one generation per year. And so right now it's actually in the pre-pupil or pupa stage in the trees. And so as temperatures warm, it'll pupate inside the tree. So you'll see the adult in the tree and they chew their way out. Um, and then we would see adult activity later on this season. The adults will feed, they'll mate and lay eggs. So they kind of chew a little divot or pivot or a little divot um, and they lay individual eggs that hatch about the size of a grain of rice. That egg hatches and it moves into through the phloem tissue. A first, second instar, they primarily are phloem feeders, and then they go to the heart of the wood as later instars. And full-grown late-stage larvae can be about the size of your finger. Um, I call them the Michelin tire men. They just describe me as, this, they remind me of the Michelin tire man. So you can see here, there are populations of Asian longhorn beetle in New York, Massachusetts, Ohio, and South Carolina. Uh, there have been many eradication efforts that have been successful. I'll talk about those just real briefly. And there's also an infestation in Toronto, Canada, that they've been dealing with. So I'm going to show this map on the left. Um, I'll blow that up in just a second. But if we take a look at the map on the right, it's actually Ohio and where our infestation is in the Buckeye State. And if you look at the little Ohio at the base of here, um, it's in Claremont County, just outside of Cincinnati, and there were three areas. And so you can see this area, sorry, I was at the wrong screen. Um, so this is the large area. This is the original infestation here. This is the quarantine. And then there are these two isolated areas in blue. And the blue lines mean that they've actually been eradicated or eliminated and it's Asian longhorn beetle free. So we hope in the near future that this red line becomes blue and Ohio doesn't have a reproducing population of Asian longhorn beetle. It's not to say though that we could have a new infestation. So we all need to be on alert for this insect. Hopefully we as humans aren't gonna move it from Claremont County to Lucas County, um, but it's not to say that we can't get a whole new infestation of this wood boar uh, from Asia.
So here's a blow up of the map. Um, if you look at those boxes, I know it's difficult to read. It has the year um, and where that infestation was. Green is good. All those green boxes or the text, the green text in the boxes mean that they have been eradicated or eliminated. And so that's good news, right? There's quite a few of those up there, including the one in Chicago. The red, though, are where active infestations are currently being managed. So again, South Carolina, Ohio, um, New York, and Massachusetts. And I know it's eight o'clock. I'm almost done. Two more quick slides here. Um, just want to mention Asian longhorn beetle host. Our maples are very good hosts, and that's a huge concern. Uh, when we were looking for emerald ash borer, we have a lot of ash trees, but one thing that we learned is, boy, we've got a lot of maples, especially in our landscapes and communities. So all sorts of maples they like. They do like horse chestnuts and buckeyes, which are the Asculus species. They also like elms and willows. And then their other host, which they're going to feed upon, they're just not their favorite. I mean, look at that list. And I... I Look at that list and see, does anybody on the call not have at least one of those host plants? Um, and interesting enough, that Katsura, so it's a non-native, right? Um, also is, is a host plant for Asian longhorn beetle. So with that, um, just a plug for the Great Lakes Early Detection Network. And I can do a presentation on just that or another um, hands-on thing, but it is an app on your phone that you can report all sorts of invasive species. So um, if you want more information, just let me know and I can share that. But with that, I am gonna end my uh, presentation. At this point, Jim, is it best to stop sharing? Yes, I think that would be that would be fine to uh, stop sharing. Um, uh, I, I know that uh, in terms of uh, I've been looking at the chat. Uh, Judy uh, was on it. I think that um, uh, she mentioned uh, just before uh, you did about the spotted lanternfly and the uh, Amherst, Ohio, uh, uh, the kind of the uh, egg masses that Judy was saying and. If I believe, I, uh, if I remember correctly, I believe Amherst is Lorraine County. So that would have been the, uh, yeah. Absolutely. And it, just a, a little side story quick. Um, the Let's see, it was a Thursday. There was the Ohio Tree Care Conference was in Cleveland. And one of my colleagues was doing a presentation on spotted lanternfly. So she spent the whole hour talking about spotted lanternfly. At the very end, she said, okay, we need your help you need to start looking at Tree of Heaven. Look for egg masses right now. Wouldn't you know, the next day, an arborist was in Amherst, saw some Tree of Heaven, pulled over, and found 40 egg masses. And so that's the power of education and the power of encouraging others to help find invasive species like this. Now, I don't want anybody on this call to find more egg masses, uh, <laughs> but I want you to look for them, because if they're there, we need to know about them. Yes, yes, it, it does make me a little bit concerned that they probably are out there, <laughs> probably out there somewhere waiting to be found, which is yeah, important to find them early. That's the best way, you know, to, uh, I guess, to, to catch them before they really start to get out of control. And I also, I was writing things down. I was uh, interested about, I know that you said with a uh, spongy moth and the connection with red bud blooming, though they're not, they're not uh, connected biologically. And I was thinking it must be something with like the, the, the temperature or the spring signals that just seem to align. Uh, do, do I have that the right? Just Absolutely. Like yep. Yeah. So we in Ohio have this great tool called Growing Degree Days. And it's got a crazy website that's long and cumbersome. I don't know what OSU was thinking. But if you search Growing Degree Days in Ohio, it's going to bring you to this website and it'll have a box that you type in your zip code and it has the today's date on it. You hit submit and it'll tell you where we are using 
local and regional weather stations where we are with growing degree day units. And so these units are accumulated when temperatures are above 50 degrees and there's a lot of math that goes into it. But we've got a website that all you need is your zip code and then it takes you to a biological calendar that has um, plant blooms and insect activity. And so it is the greatest thing. I just love plant phenology. Uh, we have a garden behind our office. And um, again, I just, if you're not familiar with it, check out that website because there's some some really interesting things. Yeah, that does. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look it up. Oh, there it is. I, I think uh, I found, I'm going to try to put it into the chat here. Oh, perfect. That sounds, Thanks, uh, Jim. Pretty great. Um, oh, let's see, where was the other, what was the other thing that, yeah, there it is. Oh, that's right. That's why I was thinking of. This came up at a, a Green Ribbon Initiative uh, meeting. I don't know if quite it qualifies as really invasive, that the fungus um, that uh, the oak wilt that I don't know much about. And um, I, I know it seems to be a, more of a problem up in like the oak openings region and where we are, you know, my, my other hat, I'm the program coordinator, Wood County parks and don't seem to have as much of that possibly our clay predominantly no not exclusively clay soils it doesn't spread as well but it seems to like to spread through sand and that was uh, another one they seem to be having more problems with absolutely there's been some question is it a native pathogen is it not native right. and so there's you know some discussion still evolving with that but um i it's been in ohio for a long time we're seeing more of it. Is it because we're looking for it or has it always been there and we just have mm -hmm. called it something else or kind of dismissed it? And so the Ohio Department of Natural Resources has actually pulled together a group um, that I'm part of about oak wilt. And so, you know, it's something early on in my career we saw in, in Northwest Ohio, um, the Metro Parks are dealing with it. Unfortunately, um, Strawberry Acres in Holland has dealt with it and lost trees. And so we've got a really good fact sheet about it. Um, and it kind of describes the overland spread by the insect that vectors the fungus, but then also underground spread through root grafts. And so it can be problematic, especially in an area that has a lot of oaks, right? So red oaks are the most susceptible. Um, white oak sometimes can kind of wall it off and actually respond and, and, and survive an infection. Right. Yeah. Thanks for, for mentioning that. It, it, oak wilt is, is not a non-native. Non um, and also one is interesting with, you know, what, what is it, you know, native species that suddenly can have different you know, uh, effects that, that you hadn't really noticed or, or seen before. So still learning a lot and, and things are, are changing. Um, Good yeah. news is, so uh, we really, the only way to know for sure if you have oak wilt or not is to have a test done. And so before, if anybody has ever had to deal with it, I mean, we collect a specimen, a sample from a branch that is dying. Uh, we overnight it or drive it down to Columbus to, to see that. And sometimes we have, um, you know, false negatives. Um, now our lab at, at Ohio State is using DNA sequencing. And so the, the specimen doesn't have to be as fresh. So if the fungus was present, um, its DNA will always be there. And so this hopefully may be a game changer um, to be able to to see if we have positives. Yeah, interesting. And one last uh, question here. This is a good one from uh, from me. Yeah, Dave Dave Simmons. Um, if you spot an invasive plant, um, and uh, is there uh, any help uh, to uh, attack the problem with like a homeowners association or even just a private owner, regardless of your your size? And uh, he does mention. I think it's a good idea contacting OSU extension oh it's definitely you uh, and, and you know the, the county extensions around the state are a great uh, resource but um, yeah how, how would you say go about that yeah so um, would love to to talk more about specific situations unfortunately we don't have dollars that would help with the management um, you know occasionally there may be some grants um, to deal with invasive species on a larger scale, especially if um, 
you know, maybe you're in the oak openings region or trying mm -hmm. to get that back to the natural areas. Uh, but we can help with the identification and confirmation of what it is and probably your management options and what those might be. Um, earlier today, I was actually meeting with the city of Toledo. We are seeing an increase in poison hemlock, um, which is a, a non-native species that um, is, I, I don't mean to be alarming and I don't want to be alarming, but um, the plant is highly poisonous. So if it's ingested, I mean, it will kill you or other animals. Yeah. And so um, there's some pockets of um, this, unfortunately. And so the city is trying to, to manage and do the right thing. Um, but we're trying to find out, okay, where, how widespread is it? Where is it at? And so it's a biennial. And so right now it is bright green, lush growing as that first year rosette. And so I'm hoping to do um, some media attention in the next couple of weeks when everything else is still a little brown, um, yes. that really stands out. And so um, as a community, they're trying to figure out how they can manage and deal with that, both on public and private lands. Yeah, yeah, that, that'd be great. Yeah, glad, glad you're there to, right, to, to assist them. I, I do see that, uh, yes, Peter has his hand up and he's off mute now. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. That was really a great presentation. I work for the Nature Conservancy in the Oak Openings region doing restoration, and we do a lot of invasive control. We're, uh, I'm talking about plants now, and we're applying a lot of herbicides and using other treatments. But recently, I've been getting the question about sustainability. We know that, it, it's, that without treatment, without repeated treatments, these plants just come back. And so I'm wondering if you have any good news on the sustainability front. Are there any biocontrols that you've been seeing that are looking good where we would not have to continually uh, come back forever <laughs> and retreat these plants? Sure. And so, um, you know, each species is a little bit different and obviously um, often Biological controls are effective at lower populations or lower levels. Um, you know, we've seen some wonderful control with loose strife um, and the beetle that was introduced to feed on that. And so, you know, I think that there are specific species that could help in the fight. Um, I don't think they're going to be an answer and ongoing monitoring is important. Um, but once you you know, have an area under control and you're managing it, it's much more easy to do small eradication efforts than feeling overwhelmed that, oh my gosh, the whole understory is honeysuckle. And so that combination, maybe with some biological controls, hopefully will help. But I think the pressure of invasive plants is going to continue, unfortunately. So really yeah. good question. And thanks for all you do. Yes. Yes. Thanks to, uh, thanks to, to Peter for, yeah, folks at the Nature Conservancy, of course, you know, all the work that Metro Parks does, our own stewardship department with County Parks. And, and also, you know, like Amy said, all of the homeowners and all the people that, you know, there, there's so much that, you know, on, on private lands and, and even places like the city of Toledo that, um, yeah, it all, it takes everyone, right? I think Amy mentioned like, it can be like a discouraging subject, but you know, knowledge is, is power. And, and when you know these things and it can point them out to your, to your neighbors and in your own yard and, and, and spreading the word, it is a lot more awareness. We can catch things in Amherst before they get over to Toledo. Uh, and yeah, like the, the lantern fly, hopefully, but yes, can always, that's a, a good thing to, to be aware uh, of and uh yeah and also I, I should say that um amy's uh you know contact information email uh, is right there on the osu extension uh website uh in uh in lucas county and uh yeah if you have any other uh questions and uh things uh to ask or things you think of in the middle of the night like, like i do sometimes that uh yeah she'd be glad to uh, talk to you about it and as she mentioned uh, read the uh, the blade. She has regular articles. I enjoy reading on a variety of uh, of subjects there, 
uh, related to not always invasive species, gardening and, and horticulture and all those uh, good things. So, yeah, yeah. that just oh. started up last or this week. So um, we'll go through October, probably into November. So hopefully it's a vehicle to get some information out to, yeah. to readers. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much uh, for everyone for joining us tonight. I should also mention that uh, next uh, month's program is uh, Dr. Stan Garrett. Uh, I know that uh, some of you are uh, seeing that and uh, we'll be here on April 21st uh, to talk about the urban coyote. Uh, yes, with uh, Dr. Uh, Garrett. Um, yes, uh, always uh, interesting to, to learn about these, uh, these tricksters. Yes, the uh, urban coyote, as well as got field trips uh, coming up. Yep, thanks. John's already on and already got information. Yes, uh, uh, birding with Matt Anderson. Boy, he, Matt Anderson, he is a great, uh, great birder, great uh, trip leader, um, as well as, yeah, coming up uh, in April. Believe it or not, we will have frogs uh, calling. I know probably the chorus frogs are already starting. Uh, the toads coming up soon. Uh, uh, wood frogs there in the Oak Openings region. But uh, yeah, looking forward to that. At Irwin Prairie, great place to uh, look and listen for frogs. So yeah, it's all there uh, on the website. Join, uh, sign up for that Zoom link. And uh, uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you out uh, the field trips at the programs. And uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Amy. It's great. Always learn, learn something. And I uh, appreciate you. Well, thanks for having me. I had a great evening. Hope everybody learned something. Yep. Thank you. Good night. Bye all. now. And we're here because we're here We're only one year older than we were this time last year, Raya Ripping to Raya, to Raya, to Raya, to Raya, to Raya Oh, to Raya, to Raya, The more a man has, the more a man wants This I don't think true I never met a man with one black guy Who wished that he had two Raya Ripping to Raya, to Raya, to Raya, to Raya